When it comes to quality sleep, Ashley has you covered with top mattress brands at winning prices and with special financing options available. You can snooze now and pay later. Plus, your mattress purchase helps give the gift of better sleep to children in need and U.S. Special Operations Forces. Visit your local Ashley store or shop online today and make every snooze count. Financing is subject to credit approval. See store or ashley.com for details. Rosetta Stone is the language learning program with a lasting impact. I've been using their app to learn French, and it's not just about memorizing words, but actually having real conversations. And it's not just French. They offer 25 languages. Right now, Rosetta Stone has an awesome holiday deal, 50% off their lifetime membership. Every language, unlimited access forever. For anyone keen on diving deep into a new language, check out rosettastone.com. It's a game changer. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man that knows another day equals another dollar. Maybe 50 cents after taxes, but in the end, it's all just puppy chow. He is the captain. Hurry up and pay your taxes. It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening, and thanks for telling a friend. This week, we are very happy to be featuring Sahayo Stout by our good friends over at the Columbus Brewing Company, garage grade, four and a quarter bottle caps out of five. This is a stout ale made with an espresso blend from Cafe Bariso with an ABV of 8.3%. So remember to drink responsibly. This week's beer was delivered to our garage fridge by, first up, a cheers to Ava in Gordonsville, Virginia. And a big we like a jib to Eric in Lockport, Illinois. Let's go across the pond and say cheers to Sarah in Bristol, England. And a big shout out to the bastards up north, Paige in Lansing, Michigan. And here's a we like your jib to Nefreen and Jay. And then last but not least, in parts unknown, we have Karen, Tim D, and Joseph. Everyone we just mentioned went to truecrimegarage.com and donated to the beer fund. And for that, we thank you. And everybody be patient, we're a little behind, but we'll get to ya. And that is enough of the beers, knees. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. In March of 1992, 20-year-old Amy Hooper was killed. She was found alone in her apartment. Someone went into her apartment and killed her on that day. Now, we've been talking about this case and talking about the investigation that followed. And we've been going through some of the suspects. And police looked into Amy's boyfriend. They looked into Amy's former boyfriends. They looked into friends, co-workers, and neighborhood sex offenders. They followed up on tips. They were working very hard on this investigation. As we both stated yesterday, this is a cold case. However, we don't believe that it's because of lack of effort on the Franklin County Sheriff's Department. In fact, it seems like there's no reasonable, logical reason that anybody would want to hurt her. In fact, Detective Clark said in an interview, quote, Amy had a lot of friends and partied a bit, but she didn't use drugs and she didn't run her mouth. She wasn't causing anyone any trouble. She hung out, she worked hard, and she did her job. It doesn't seem that Amy was mixed up in anything nefarious at the time of her murder. And the other thing that they followed up on, too, regarding this investigation, and they reported this in the papers, there were no known disturbances reported at her apartment complex in the weeks prior to her death. So nothing appeared to be out of order. 
right? Yeah. And then once inside the apartment, inside the, the apartment, which is in fact the murder scene, we have a situation where we have no signs of a break in, mm-hmm. no signs of forced entry. And it didn't appear that anything had been stolen. I mean, she was still wearing her diamond ring when her body was found. I once heard a detective talk about how some perpetrators will go around. Columbus has an outer belt, Mm -hmm. 270. And they would drive around 270 and get off at exits and start trying to look for opportunities. And I wonder if somebody possibly saw her in Grove City and then followed her back to the Lincoln apartments, Lincoln right. Village apartments, because the apartments are not that far off the exit. Correct. Yeah, actually, they are very close from that uh, 270 exit. And that's an interesting take. And I actually believe that that might be a likely scenario here. And that would mean that she was killed by a stranger. Right. Amy was a very attractive young woman. It's not inconceivable that some maniac would be out there driving around looking for a young, attractive woman and follow her home and see her going alone into this apartment. Right. The only tough thing about that theory for me is the lack of evidence on a sexual assault. I want to point out some weird things in this case. And mind you, I want you to to make mental note before I go into this of the location. You know that location fairly well. Okay, so as police were investigating Amy's case, this is pretty quickly. Actually, in fact, within just the the short few weeks following the murder, a few women on the west side of Columbus told authorities that they were receiving strange phone calls. Detective Clark told the media, quote, people would get calls from a man who would say, remember Amy Hooper, you're going to end up just like that. Mm. Now, the reason why I point out that I believe that that is so strange is, remember we covered a case about a year or so ago. This was William Comines, or Bill Comines, lived in that same area. Now, he has a mysterious death. It's, it's not been ruled a homicide. You and I agreed that it was a mysterious death. But... There were threatening calls and letters that were going on after his death, and he actually lived very close to where Amy Hooper would have lived at the time of her death. Now, mind you, their deaths are separated by 12 years. Right. So it's likely it wasn't the same individual, but I found it so strange that you would have such a small area where you have, one, a mysterious death, and then, two, a full-blown homicide— and you have these strange calls that are going on. This is a threatening phone call. Yeah. Remember Amy Hooper, who was just in the news? Remember that murder victim? Yeah. You're going to end up just like her. Yeah, and somebody that we believe was bludgeoned to death and then stabbed after death. I mean, this is a vicious murder. I mean, what kind of sick-minded donkey spanker starts calling women and saying, you're going to end up like that dead girl? Well, and the other thing, too, that you have to wonder about is... If these if these calls were related to her murder, if that's true, then it casts some doubt on the detective's stated theory that Amy's murder was personal and targeted. That would be my guess. Yeah, but we've seen with serial killers or other cases, and you, you'd know more about this than I would, where you have individuals that are, it's a personal attack, but only because it is a female that female that Amy Hooper would she she would represent mm-hmm. a different female in this killer's life, right? So that you know uh, their victim that is female would represent their mother or ex lover that that ruined their life, right? Correct. So that's where it gets pretty convoluted. You know, you're exactly right. You have a situation that when you have overkill, usually ninety. Five percent of the time, that's going to point to the offender knew the victim right. and wanted to, for lack of better term, destroy the victim, not just kill them, destroy them. Mm-hmm. But as you stated, we've seen it time and time again with serial killers and with repeat offenders that they're trying to destroy somebody else. 
that right. the victim represents somebody else. And sometimes it can be as simple as they have a deep rooted hatred of women in general. Right. So that's a difficult thing. And then f- regarding these phone calls, captain, Police were never able to find out anything more about these calls. They looked into this angle here, but they couldn't figure out more, one more about the calls or if they were, in fact, connected to Amy's murder at all. Well, they could have just been pranks. Right. And this is maybe a handful of years right before everybody was getting caller ID when that was like the big thing. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, we get caller ID now. Like, right. And so it was a perfect time for for an individual that is sick minded to do this correct well and then the other thing too one thing that's been suspected for years we talked about ears uh the golden state killer mm-hmm. it's believed that he called females in that area with threatening calls and strange i've i've heard some of these recordings very weird strange calls but yeah. they suspect that because most of his victims were in fact women, or that's who he was seeking out as a victim, they think that that was a way for him to later relive some of those crimes and yeah. to gain excitement after the fact. So we may have a situation here that if these calls are connected, that it is from the killer and yeah. it is from somebody trying to relive that moment or get some kind of excitement out of the fear that he is hearing from the woman on the other end of the line. Well, not just excitement, but possibly getting some kind of understanding of how's he getting these numbers? Is he calling these numbers by random? And if so, he could be looking these numbers up in the white pages. Mm -hmm. And if he's looking up these numbers in the white pages, for the young listeners, they would deliver a book to your house that would give you a list of all these people's addresses and their phone numbers. So then you would know that this number is connected to this address Mm -hmm. and okay, a female answered, you know, so that, you know, raises some excitement. It gets your boner juices going. Well, and we talked about yesterday how they looked into the abusive boyfriend that Amy had when she was in high school. We talked about them looking into her very good natured boyfriend that he had, that she had, uh, at the current time of her death. Yeah, the Bowling Green student. Correct. We haven't talked about some other possible suspects. Okay, let's get into them right now. So one thing that's interesting is investigators did talk to Amy's roommate. Remember, she had offered up her apartment to allow a young woman to move in with her who had a child, and it seems to be, according to her family, Right. That this was really Amy helping somebody out. This was not a roommate in the sense that the roommate was sharing in the responsibilities of the apartment, paying for the apartment. This was somebody that she was helping out. Now, investigators talked to this roommate. According to what I could find, she did pass. She took and passed a polygraph exam and was ruled out as a suspect. She told investigators that she did not recognize the medallion, the necklace that we spent so much time talking about yesterday that was found wrapped around Amy's wrist. But that's a little strange to me in a sense that we now know that it did belong to Amy. But again, I guess they only lived there for like three weeks. So could it be been an oversight on her part? Likely. Right. The family... Amy Hooper's family is somewhat suspicious of this roommate. They tell us that she, quote, happened, just happened to leave for Florida the night before Amy was killed. And they believe that she knows more than what she is willing to say or what she told investigators. Well, and this is what gets difficult for us and then Amy's family is that DNA that or they claim they're testing people to clear them. Who's this DNA from as far as like, is it even connected to Amy or is it connected to this roommate? Mm -hmm. And so there could be relationships that she is not telling the police about. And that would be shady. Right, right. And that's the thing that I think that the family is suspicious of. I don't think that the family has any belief that the roommate killed Amy. 
I believe that it's it could be simply something as maybe the roommate's boyfriend had something to do with it or somebody that she knew. Mm-hmm. Their their statement to me was plain and simple. We're suspicious of her. We think that it's quite convenient that she just happened to go to Florida the night before Amy was killed. And then we believe that she knows more than what she's saying. As far as police are, are concerned, mm-hmm. she has been ruled out. Now, we don't know if this was because of DNA testing or if it's simply that they can prove that she was in Florida when she says she was in Florida. Riddle me this, Batman. How does somebody that can't afford to get her own place and is using the help of a 20-year-old, how does this individual have the funds to go to Florida? Mm -hmm. I mean, that would be my big question. I don't want to make any inferences here, but my thought is that we might be thinking of this as a vacation. I'm thinking it's probably more of a move. My guess, because what I do know from the investigation is that the police did have a hard time. They had a tough time finding this roommate initially. See, that makes it even more shady to me. Like, it would be different if she moved. Let's say it wasn't for vacation. It was just for for a move that you would think that she would have heard about this girl that helped her out. She would have heard about her death and then got in contact with the police. So that's even more suspicious in my mind. It could be. I, I see what you're saying there. I There's a chance she may have had no way of knowing. You know what I mean? We, we don't know the, the, the circumstances of her going to Florida. Right. So I think, I think when you start to make inferences, you can assume different things, but mm-hmm. we might not be on the right track there. Them having trouble tracking her down may just be something as simple as she was, had fallen on hard times, knew someone in Florida who was offering her a place to stay. And she found a way to get down there right. and stayed there for a while. Her, her being hard to track down may not be because of any of her own efforts. It just may be happenstance. But what we do know is the police seem to believe that she is not a suspect, that she has been ruled out as having any possible involvement. I agree with the family, though. It's a weird set of, set of circumstances. Right. Yeah, and they have the right to be suspicious. And and I think it's also, um, you can put a little weight. Look, Amy helped you out. We're going to put a little weight on you for you to kind of present it to me that I shouldn't be suspicious of you. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Right. And so, I don't know. Seems a little little fishy. Now, remember we said how close Amy was with her family, specifically her sister, Sandy. Now, one thing that Amy, I'm sorry, Sandy tells us all of these years later, right. and this is something that she's told others along the way, is something that she has always been very concerned about. In the weeks prior to Amy's death, Amy called Sandy a few times complaining about a young man who wouldn't, quote, leave her alone. This was someone that was in her group of friends, in Amy's group of friends. But according to what Amy's telling Sandy, she believed this guy wanted more and wouldn't leave her alone. Right. He, he continued to bug her and wouldn't take no for an answer. You say he's younger, so she's 20. How old is this No, kid? I just said a young man. Okay, so we don't know if he's younger or older than than Amy. What we do know is he was in her group of friends. I'm assuming they're roughly the same age. And has have they had any of the friends come forward and say this is the individual? This is his name? So we could at least question him and test his DNA? Okay. Well, th- there's some issue with this individual. Okay. Okay. Um in Sandy's opinion, his behavior rose to the level of harassment or even stalking. Yeah. And mind you, this is just what she's going off of from what her sister's telling her. I know all about that these days. So she tells Amy that you should file an official complaint against this guy. Right. Amy tells her, I'm not going to file an official complaint because this guy is connected. And Connected. Yes. 
it turns out that he is the son of the Columbus police chief. Hmm. So his DNA, from what I could find, has never been tested in Amy's case. How convenient. Yeah. Wow. That's a twist. And But it's strange because it seems like the cops are putting in the work. Seems like the cops are. They're different departments, though. Uh, true. We have Franklin County Sheriff's Department is investigating Amy Hooper's murder. But sometimes this the- individual at the time is the son of the Columbus Police Department's police chief. Right. Not the current chief. Correct. But at the time. But sometimes these departments don't like each other. So wouldn't it be. Well, that's what I told somebody. So, so somebody on the outside looking in on this case. Right. Um, a, a friend of mine, Jessica, she has helped with this case and helped with some other cases in the past. Uh-huh. And she asked me, she said, Nick, you're from the area. I need your opinion on something because I found a suspect and I knew exactly who she was talking about, but I wanted to hear what she had to say. And so she tells me who this suspect is. He, she goes, the, what I'm finding is he's the son of the police chief at the time. And I said, yeah, I'm aware of that. Mm-hmm. And she said, well, what's your opinion? Would, would there be good reason for Franklin County to sweep this under the rug and not make a move on this guy because his father is the police chief of Columbus. And I said, look, I don't have any super insider information on that kind of stuff, Mm -hmm. but being a local, I, I can't really cite one incident where I remember something like that going down. I actually can cite a few incidences where I believe there to be somewhat of bad blood between the two. Yeah, so you'd think this would be a godin moment. Hey, let's bring this son of a bitch in for questioning, and 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 let's see what how his story checks out. Maybe we can test his DNA, mm-hmm. and then we could get to the bottom of it. And if we have this, if we have this son of a bitch on our radar, do we have? I mean, this is you know many years have passed, my friend. So has he done any crimes that are even remotely close to this that, no. that we're aware of? No. So I don't, I don't believe so. So a complete clean record, maybe a parking ticket. Um, I can't say that with 100% certainty, and, but, and I will tell you why. Okay. Because the, the ind- which individual this is is not super clear as far as public knowledge goes. Okay, but... And this this will make sense once I say this to you. Okay. The police chief has two sons. So... So it's not clear which son it is. Right. As far as public knowledge goes, it's one of the two. Now, only people on the insider, on the inside circles would know which one it was. Okay? Or one that was being suspected of this or some type of involvement. Regarding the family... Uh, who passed this tip along to to me? They they do not know which one it would have been either. It wouldn't take too much to get the DNA from both of them, mm-hmm. and then have that tested against. Well, it would take a warrant, and I think that that's the Wait, issue. Do you need a warrant to get somebody's cup? No, like if but they're drinking out of a cup. They're smoking a cigarette. You know, and get the cigarette butt. And go test that. Do you need a warrant for that? Um, in fact, you might. You okay. actually might need that. Now, now, I I don't want to go too far into that because that's not. Those are semantics that I don't know or understand. Right. I do know in DNA cases that we've talked about before that have been solved, they did have warrants for that to to go about doing that. Uh, that's a way to make sure that it doesn't fall through by the time you get to court. Now, if you go and you steal this guy's DNA sample somehow, they may say, well, you can't use this in court. And, oh, the only bit of information you have is the DNA matched. Well, now that's that's inadmissible. You can't use that in court. Right, right, right. So you've lost your whole case. So the thing is, what what I'm pointing out here is I don't see a situation where anyone has gone, "Mm, we're not going to talk to this guy because this is the job that his father has. I see a situation where we have 
people a suspect, a potential suspect. I want to be very clear about that. This is all just rumor. We have a guy that could be a potential suspect. But from law enforcement perspective, they're probably going, you know what? We've reached out and tried to talk to this guy. He probably lawyered up. He probably has a lawyer that says, what's your evidence? We're not going to go in there and do any questioning. What's your evidence? Mm -hmm. Oh, you can't tell us? You can't specifically link my guy to your crime, to your murder? Well, we're not going to talk to you. Oh, you want DNA to clear my, my client? Right. Well, we're not going to we're not going to issue you that either unless you have a warrant. So, well, and then on top of that, you have somebody that can help him stay out of the system as far as prints, possibly prints, possibly DNA, as far as I'm I'm sure his father now is a former law enforcement. So, but still, they know people. So, let's just say one of these individuals got a DUI or something, you know, a cop can call in some favors. So maybe that's possibly another reason why they're not in the system. And do we have any clue of when the last time they took this DNA and ran it through the system to see if an uh, individual has been arrested? Yes. I, I've spoke to the cold case detective Okay, a couple of times. And the family has stayed in contact with the cold case detective. Amy Hooper's family has stayed in contact. And from what I've, the information that's been presented to me is that they have, you're going to like this. They have not only DNA on this case, but there, this is not a situation where they have questionable DNA. This is not a, a, a case where they're like concerned of running out of the evidence. This is a situation where they have very good DNA on file of the perpetrator, of the individual that killed Amy Hooper. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Do you look forward to the holidays? Maybe you struggle with seasonal blues. This time of year can be a lot. And it's natural to feel some sadness or even anxiety about it. But adding something new and positive to your life can counteract some of those feelings. Therapy can be a bright spot, something to look forward to, to make you feel grounded, and to give you the tools to manage everything going on. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash garage today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash garage. Dreaming of overseas adventures or connecting more deeply with family from afar? Rosetta Stone bridges the language gap. I've tried others, but Rosetta Stone's immersive lessons and voice feedback technology are game changers. Dive into 25 languages by learning intuitively, just like when you were a kid. And here's the holiday sparkle. Grab a lifetime membership now and save 50%. Gift yourself the world. Head to rosettastone.com now and save 50%. You can live out your MasterChef dreams. When you find a professional on Angie to tackle your dream kitchen remodel. Connect with skilled professionals to get all your home projects done well. Visit Angie.com. You can do this when you Angie that. All right. Cheers, everybody. Hope everybody's having a good week. Cheers to you, Captain. Here's another thing. Cheers to technology. We have said on this show repeatedly that we are living in the golden age of solving cold cases thanks to DNA technology that's going on today. And that wouldn't be possible without computers. That's right. And while I don't understand science and how it works, I certainly understand computers. (laughs) (laughs) And also very opinionated on books that you read. That's right. Hey, so regarding this case in particular, we were talking about the DNA. Right. Okay. I am of a firm belief from, from information that's been presented to me 
that not only do they have good DNA evidence against the perpetrator of this murder, but they have such good DNA that they do not mind testing it from time to time. According to the detective, I've been told that they test it every few years to see if it matches anyone who's been put into the system. And we also know that they've used it multiple times throughout the course of the years, throughout the course of the decades, to clear some individuals that they were looking at as potential suspects. Right, but we don't know how they got the DNA or what the DNA is from, blood, semen, whatever. Well, this is one of those cases where, look, we don't know if there was a sexual assault, okay? According to what police have told the media and the newspapers, they're unclear about that. They're, they've never said that there was one or that there wasn't one. Right. So we don't know that information. According to Amy's family, who we've spoke to, they're a mixed bag. Okay. Um, a couple of them think maybe that that could be a possibility and others think that it, that that was not the situation. But one thing we can consider is we do know a knife was involved. And one thing that we've talked about several times on this show is that usually when a knife is involved, sometimes the offender cuts themselves. Yeah, you get that old slippery hand. And not only was a knife involved, but we know that the knife was found at the scene. So there's a chance that they've pulled the DNA from that knife and that the offender cut himself in the act of killing her. I personally hope that he cut himself a whole bunch of times. Yeah, seems like an oil wristed ball fiddler. In regards to the police chief's son, I want to be very clear about something here when we talk about that situation, because I do not want to get ourselves into any hot water with information that we do not know, because you and I talk to people that work for Columbus Police Department. And we don't want people showing up to our house. (laughs) <laughs> well, and, garage. and I know individuals and have friends that work for the Columbus Police Department, so I do not want to throw out there. <laughs> That's a humble brag. I do not want to throw out there that we are assuming that the police chief covered anything up for his son. Right. This very well could be a situation if this in- individual is in fact involved at all, if they were involved there's a good chance that his father knew nothing about this. Right. Okay. There, there are many bad sons out there that do bad things and their parents are never aware of it at all. Yeah. Sorry, dad. So the other thing I want to talk about is another possible theory that was presented to me by the family. And this was a theory regarding Amy's job and her position at the uh, leather store. She had actually told, Amy told her mother and her now, so her mother has since remarried. Remember, they were going through a divorce at the time of of her death. And she was having dinner with her mother and her her mother's now husband a short time before she was killed. And one story she was telling her mother was that there, there was some struggle within her circle of friends or coworkers. And what that struggle was, Amy had knowledge that individuals were either stealing from the store or were planning to do so. And they were trying to get her involved in this, or at least turn and look the other way. Oh, Lulu lemon murders. And Amy seemed very upset about this. Amy was not going to one, be involved And two, she was not going to look the other way. Yeah. What we do know about Amy's timeline from what she told her mother, there was a scheduled manager's meeting at her work the day that she was murdered. Yeah. Maybe that's what they're going to go over in the meeting. It doesn't take Sherlock Holmes to figure out that was one of these guys or one of these people that was stealing from the store. And these could be expensive items too. Yeah. Leather jackets. Yeah. You know what? 300 bucks for a leather jacket or a more, maybe a million. (laughs) Well, I've never owned one. It doesn't take, it doesn't take Sherlock Holmes to figure out that there's a chance that somebody may have wanted to silence Amy Hooper. 
Yeah, we like like I said, I mean, we've a little bit of a different situation, but look at the Lulu Lemon murders. And it's the same type of thing. Somebody is found caught stealing, you know? Mm-hmm. Jane's addiction style. Well, but think about this too. So this individual, let's say it was somebody that worked with her. What can we gather from that? One, they would they would know what time she would have to be at work. So from that, they can go back and, and probably figure out what time she would be home. Right. I don't know that they would know for a fact that she was home alone, but really this is what I picture here, Captain. We could have a Holly Brennigan situation. Remember we talked about that case where a young girl, she was what, 17 at the time? Uh-huh. She was stabbed to death in her kitchen when she was home alone. Yeah. And the theory that we presented there was that her, some guy that she was seeing at the time thought that she may be pregnant with his baby. Right. And we put out a theory that there was evidence to believe that his father may have gone to Holly's home with the intention of talking to her and talking her out of keeping the baby. Yeah. And when that conversation did not go the way he wanted it, he lost it, went off the rails and attacked Holly and killed her there in her kitchen. So now you have to wonder, do we have a situation here where it's very similar? We have somebody stealing from work that's either trying to get her involved or trying to get Amy to look the other way, shows up to her apartment, friendly knock on the door, right? Yeah. Yeah. We have police saying that they believe that Amy opened up the door, that either she let the killer into her apartment or at the very least opened up the door. And then this individual confronts her and tries to persuade her to not turn him in, to not bring him up at the manager's meeting. Right. Or not turn... And his wife. And she doesn't go along with that. And he loses it, goes off the rails and attacks her. Yeah. Could be similar situation. The other thing, though, too, is we have another situation. We talked about Christy Merrick on the show, Uh who who an individual became infatuated with her, followed her back to her home, was there in the early morning hours, broke into the home or 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 simply just opened up the door and attacked her there. So we have two very similar situations to cases that we've covered before in the past. The other thing too, regarding the door, regarding her front door that I've always kind of questioned here, we can't be certain that the door was even locked, right? You brought up the opportunity, the, the opportunist, the opportunity killer of somebody that just happened to spot this attractive young woman follows her home or sees her approaching her apartment, realizes that she's alone and decides maybe he decides I'll just go check the door. Oh, it's not locked and welcomes himself in. Yeah. Well, this case has not only does it have a situation, it has a poly D as a, as a Ron, Ron juice it has a J wow and a Snooky. But I think you also can't rule out, this idea that she opened up the door because she just knew somebody. This is also a different time. Knock, knock on the door. You open it up. You just don't feel threatened. And you and you say, oh, and it could be a stranger. And that's how they get access. And, yeah, there's no proof that they pushed her down and pushed her through the door. But what if it was just they said a couple things enough to get in the door? Because this person, we have evidence, was at least willing to help out not even a known friend, not like a best friend, but let's say acquaintance, single mom acquaintance. She said, come come live with me till you get on your feet. So I think this somebody, somebody like that is more um, susceptible to to somebody gaining access. Well, no, that's a very good point. We have, um, Amy's mother who, who said to us that she isn't convinced that Amy didn't just leave her door unlocked, that she may have been young enough and naive enough that maybe, or just forgetful enough that she left the front door unlocked. Well, if we carry that thought mother's intuition, if we carry that thought a step further, 
well, maybe the door was locked. Somebody knocked on the door. We don't have any reason to believe that she wouldn't have just opened up the door with that without having any proof of who it was on the other side. Right. Yeah. And that's what makes this case difficult. But what gives you hope is the amount of DNA evidence that they have that they can continue to test that one day this case is going to get solved. Well, remember what I told you. So we do a a weekly meeting behind, you know, behind the scenes meeting Mm -hmm. where we talk about upcoming cases and cases that we would like to cover and maybe reasons why we should cover those cases. And when I brought up Amy, Amy Hooper's case and I, and I said to you, I want to cover this and it's been sitting on my shelf long enough that, that it needs to be covered soon. Yeah. And you've been able to talk with our family, which has been great. Her family's fantastic. They've gone through something horrible. They don't have any answers and my heart, my heart bleeds for them. I mean, I, I cannot believe what they've been through. Here's the thing though. Here's where I can offer hope is that when I told you on the phone in one of our meetings, I said, not only do we need to cover it because this case is close to us in proximity, but it also has some closeness in our, our families and in our, our friends' lives. You know, we're from somewhat the same area right. there. Some of the circles were the same. I mean, my, my mother worked at the same school as Amy's mother. Well, and we've always said that it's important to find cases that we're passionate about, but also can we help at all mm-hmm. and can we move the needle at all? And really by talking about some of these cases, they can generate new leads. So uh, the fact that you are passionate about it and it's just a case that nobody's ever heard of outside of Columbus. Mm-hmm. Well, the other thing that I told you too, is I said, not only do I believe this case will be solved. I mean, I want to be clear about this. I, I'm beyond be- belief at this point. This right. case will 100% be solved. All right. I'm giving you a kernel guarantee right Spicy here. Spicy or crispy. That this thing will be solved. And I tell you why. What we led in here with this segment with the golden age of DNA investigations. Computers. They will find this individual. They have very good DNA evidence. All they have to do. Okay. You have, you have two angles you can go for here. What you do is you go and you check for familial DNA. You, d- you do that investigation. Right. You see if you can lock on to the family tree of the perpetrator and then track down the perpetrator. The other angle would be if that does not give you the result that you're hoping for, then at the very least you would have what we refer to as snapshot DNA, right? which would provide you further explanation of who this offender likely is. It's, it's almost like a criminal profile, but in a sense that it's all physical and DNA makeup, right? So we would know for certain. Yeah. If if they have this information, if they can't pinpoint the exact individual, we would know for certain the individual's gender. We would know their ethnic background, their race. We would know some things about their physical appearance. That could take this investigation to another level. And that's where we are at with technology these days. That could happen in this case. And I'm hoping and praying that it does. Well, just imagine all the sweaty pieces of shit throughout the country, sweating, sweating to the oldies because they know that this technology is out there. Yeah. Well, you know what? That's the thing that I almost find, you know, you have to find a little bit of silver lining in some of this stuff. We talk about so many tragic stories and so many sad stories on this show. One thing that does bring me, a good amount of joy and almost something that I, I, I kind of laugh at is that a lot of these guys, these, these, these murderers that have been lucky enough. Okay. They've, they've just been lucky. It's not because they're smart. It's not because of anything like that. They've just been lucky that they've been able to scrape by and not be detected yet. Right. None of them ever suspected that investigation would get to this point. 
that someday you won't be able to hide. Someday you won't be able to hide from the horrible, horrible things that you have done from the horrible person that you actually are. And we will find you. And you mentioned all those guys out there that are sweating, sweating to the oldies. They're yeah. scared that they're going to be found out. This is a, a, a primary example. This case will be a primary example for exactly how this technology works and how it is used to lead them to the front door of the perpetrator, of the murderer who was able to scrape by and hide and remain in the shadows for all these years. The individual might even listen to these episodes, might see his victim's name on a computer and say, you know what? I'm going to click on that. Right. I'm going to see where the investigation is. I'm going to see what they're talking about. Well, the investigation is hunting you down right now. That's where this is. The DNA is so good in this case that they will find you. And it's only a matter of time before Franklin County Sheriff's Department starts using this actual technology. It's only a matter of time before it leads them directly to your front door. Now, I do want to make sure before we close out here today, Captain, that we thank Amy Hooper's family. Yes. Who is still hurting all these years later. They still are missing their loved one, their sister, their daughter. Amy's mother is still alive. She's elderly at this point. Um, they've moved away from the state of Ohio many years ago, but her family remains active in her investigation, in this murder investigation. They check in with the sheriff's department and the sheriff's department remains active on this investigation as well. So I want to applaud her family for taking the time to speak with us regarding this, this cold case that we are definitely passionate about that means something to us. This is not something that has been lost. This is not a story that's going to be swept under the rug. This is something that is going to get solved. And we're here to remind people about it in the meantime. Oh, crispy kernel. It's been a, it's been a while since you got a little tipsy. Well, I'm dealing with some stuff that... A lot I'm of having, stuff. Having a hard time dealing with them. So this is not a healthy way of dealing with it, but that's, well, that's how I'm choosing to deal with it. How about we do a little recommended reading before we close out here today, Captain? This is a fantastic book. It's called My 30 Years as an FBI Undercover Agent. All right. It's the title is Ghost. My 30 Years as an Undercover FBI Agent. This is by Michael McGowan and I didn't know this, Captain, but only about 10% of FBI special agents are trained and certified to actually work undercover. Now, Michael McGowan has worked more than 50 undercover cases, so he's been one of the best. Check out his book, Ghost. You don't have to write down that title or the author's name right now because we will put that on our website for you with all of our other recommended reading books on our recommended page. Just go to truecrimegarage.com and click on the recommended page. Yeah, make sure you check out our bonus weekly show called Off the Record. Follow us on social media and all that good stuff. And until next week, be good, be kind, and don't litter. You can live out your master chef dream when you find a professional on Angie to tackle your dream kitchen remodel. Connect with skilled professionals to get all your home projects done well. Visit Angie.com. You can do this when you Angie that.